Thanks, everyone, uh, joining this session on a Saturday afternoon. And I think it's close to lunchtime or past lunchtime. So yeah, thanks for being here. And so this tutorial is about our uh, uh, toolkit. It's called Uncertainty Quantification 360. I'm Prasanna Satyagiri, and I have my colleagues, um, Soumya Ghosh and uh, Jerry Navratu from IBM Research. And uh, so we will be presenting this toolkit. Um, um, so just before we start, these are some useful links. So we have a web uh, uh, page where you can get more details about the toolkit, and there is a nice demo which I will briefly describe. And uh, this is the GitHub link, and this is for pip installation, right? And uh, we do have a channel in the PyData workspace for uncertainty quantification, so you can ask questions there, and we can have conversations there. Uh, Later on, but for more longer term, we also have a separate workspace, which is at this link. If you go here, we can get an invite, get on this workspace, and there's a separate channel for UQ360. All right, so, um, so let's get right into it, right? So this is a quick agenda of uh, today's session. I will start with describing some basic concepts of uncertainty quantification introduce what we mean by uncertainty quantification, especially um, it, with respect to AI uh, models and so on, uh, briefly describe the toolkit, and I'll jump into the uh, interactive web experience that we have. And after that, we'll take a brief pause um, and you can install the package if you like, uh, because this following sessions will be by Samia and Juri, and they'll deep dive into some of the uncertainty quantification algorithms and metrics. So if you would like to install the package, you could do that so that you can follow along the um, hands-on tutorials that uh, Juri and Samia have. And if there is time, I will briefly touch upon how uncertainty quantification is um, also related to other uh, pillars of trustworthy AI. Uh, specifically how we can uh, use it for explainability and fairness and so on, All right? Okay, so yeah, so the what question, right? So what do we mean by uncertainty quantification AI? So, um, I mean, simply it's the ability for an AI model to say I'm unsure, right? So uh, think of critical systems like in medical domain and so on, right? So if you have a system, uh, that is trying to predict the uh, presence of pneumonia, let's say. Um, so we don't just want a system which gives us a best guess, right? So to really make the predictions actionable, we need some measure of uncertainty or confidence from the model also, right? So, uh, so how would it look like, right? For example, if this is a binary classification task, if the job of the system is to predict the presence of pneumonia and no pneumonia, then we also want to know the model confidence scores, right? So, so for example, in this specific case, for this particular instance, we see that the model is not very confident. So even though it's predicting no pneumonia, but the confidence is not really high. So what a user in this case, for example, a doctor could do is to sort of reject the model's prediction because it's not really confident. So they can either go to some other expert, go to some other system, collect more features and so on. So if you have access to good quality uncertainty estimates, you add a layer of safety, a layer of transparency, and sort of enables human AI collaboration, right? So, um, so it's kind of critical, especially in systems like medical um, uh, domains and uh, justice domains, hiring, let's say, wherever there is an end user uh, who's affected by the model decisions, we need these kind of uh, outputs or confidence scores or uncertainty scores from the model, right? And the other aspect is the model improvement itself, right? So if the model can exhibit or provide us some good confidence measures, then we can get some guidance in how to improve the model, right? So, so active learning is one such framework. So um, you can have a model, if it gives you uncertainty scores, you can look at the region of the input where the model is least confident and try to collect data from that space, right? So it, it's useful in being uh, acting as a guide for model improvement. Right? So, I mean, the question now comes is, uh, we have a model that can give some uncertainty at SMS, let's say, and do, are they trustworthy, right? Are they reliable? So we need some metrics to measure how good these uncertainty estimates are, 
and typically we don't have access to ground truth uncertainty uh, scores right so the most common way to measure how good uncertainties are is to some surrogate uh, metric such as calibration right and these can look slightly different based on is it a classification task or a regression task and so on and in the classification task reliability plot is one common uh, approach to uh, look at how good the uncertainty estimates are calibrated right um, so uh, so i'll briefly explain this uh, and it might be useful in the later hands on sessions right so so what is a good uh, property of confidence scores or uncertainty estimates, right? So in the classification case, let's say there's a binary classification task. And if the model is predicting, let's say for a certain group of instances, a score of 0.8, right? For uh, along with its predictions, then a well-calibrated uncertainty score or confidence scores would have an average accuracy of 80% on those set of instances, right? So that's, that's what we expect. So uh, so a well-calibrated system, the curve, the reliability uh, curve should be this diagonal line, right? And if you see this blue uh, model here, for example, if you take all the instances which had confidence score as 0.8, this average score is 0.6, right? So this means that the model is overconfident, it is not well-calibrated. Similarly, if uh, the model had a lot more accuracy than its average confidence, then it is underconfident in some sense. And both could be um, harmful or disadvantageous in certain situations, right? So we need these kind of metrics to measure how good the uncertainty scores are, and we want them to be well calibrated, right? And similarly, uh, this might be even easier to understand in a regression case. And in the regression case, uh, typically we measure calibration through these two concepts. So the first one is the prediction interval coverage probability, also called as miss rate. And the second one is the mean prediction interval width or also called the bandwidth, right? So let's look at these two examples, right? So uh, this is one model, this is another model. Um, let's say there is only one input feature and we have a scalar output and the blue is the ground truth, right? In both cases. And if you see the, the dots are the mean estimates of the model, the best guesses of the model, and they are quite similar in both cases, but the prediction intervals in this case, the upper and lower in, uh, quantiles are kind of varying in these two models, right? And if you look in this case, the uncertainty is quite large. Um, for most instances. Here, it's small for most instances, right? And we can compute this PICP score or the prediction interval coverage probability by looking at all the instances uh, where the, the prediction interval actually covered the ground truth, right? So this is the desirable property, right? So you have a prediction, you get a prediction interval, the upper and lower quantiles, we want the ground truth to actually cover, uh, be covered in those uh, uh, prediction intervals, right? So in this case, three instances are covered and one is missing. So this is the PICP score is three by four or 0.75, right? And you can also compute the average width of these prediction intervals, and which is which tells you how uncertain the model is on an average. Similarly, for this model, you can see that only one data point is covered um, uh, by these prediction intervals. So here, the PICP score will be one by four or 0 0 0.25. Whereas its uh, uncertainty on an average is low, um, uh, let's say 15, but we know that this is not very trustworthy, right? Because its coverage probability is uh, not great. So we'll come back to these concepts when uh, we go through the web demo and also when uh, Jiri and Somya will talk about the uh, different uh, quantification algorithms. Okay. so. So I mean, just a quick uh, primer on why these uncertainties may not be well calibrated, right? So it could be a number of reasons, but one reason could be that the model doesn't capture all sources of uncertainties, right? So what are the different sources of uncertainty? So um, one is there could be inherent variability in the data itself, right? So given a particular feature value, the outcome could vary slightly each time. And this is called as data uncertainty. And this could be hard to reduce just by observing more data samples, right? So if we observe more data samples uh, across all the regions of the input space, then we can reduce the model uncertainty. So what that means is the model has seen uh, uh, training samples in all the uh, uh, places, 
So, um, so it, it's much more confident, right? But if there are some regions here which the model has not seen any instances, there will be large. There should be large uncertainty in those regions. All right. Um, so, um, so yeah. So that brings to this next point, right? So we need metrics and we need algorithms which can. Uh, which have diverse properties, right? So they should be able to capture data uncertainty. They should be able to capture model uncertainty. And there are some trade-offs in the sense that uh, how much computational power we have, how much data we have, and so on. So each situation might require us to use a, a sort of model with different properties. And if you are building a model from scratch, then you can go with some sort of in intrinsic algorithm, right? Which captures uncertainty uh, by its design. But uh, it's also possible that we uh, have a model that is already trained and then its calibration properties or uncertainty properties are not so great. Then we want some sort of algorithms which can improve their calibration, their uncertainty properties. And uh, one class of algorithms are something called as meta models, which Jury will describe a little bit more in detail. And then we also have infinite decimal jackknife, which is an interesting approach to extract uncertainties in a post hoc manner, which Jiri will cover in detail. Right. Um, and also an important point, we need to communicate the uncertainty to the end users uh, in a meaningful way, right? And each user might have different um, um, uh, desired properties of how it is communicated to them, right? So some might uh, want the full sort of uh, gamut of uh, the distribution. The others may just want you to convey some sort of gist of the model predictions in a much more digestible way, right? So we need to think about the end users and how should we communicate this uncertainty. So, I mean, so that's what the toolkit is trying to provide. So there is a workflow for uncertainty quantification and the toolkit tries to provide building blocks for each step of this workflow, right? So um, just to go through this flowchart. So if you, have a if you don't have a model, then you start out, uh, you have a choice of using intrinsic UQ algorithms, right? A model which can give you uncertainty by default. And if you see, if first you evaluate how good these uncertainties are, if it is not so great, then you can try to calibrate it using some sort of post hoc uncertainty uh, quantification algorithms. Uh, and you can complete this loop. And when you are satisfied with the uncertainty estimates quality, then you can think of how do I best communicate this to the users, right? So, um, so let's look at the web interface now, and which will sort of give a very quick example of this workflow. Okay. Go to the browser. All right. So um, let's try to zoom in a little bit. Okay, so um, so this is a very simple example, right? So there are two personas here. There is a data scientist and uh, there is a house seller. And the, the data scientist is trying to build a model to predict the uh, prices um, of the houses, right? And then uh, uh, the house seller will look at the model's predictions and its uncertainty estimates and trying to either accept or reject the model prediction, right? So, um, so as I said, there are different steps in this workflow, right? So data scientists choose a model uh, which has UQ capability, then they can measure how good these uncertainty estimates are. They can do some sort of post hoc recalibration to improve the uh, UQ estimate quality. Uh, they can use the uncertainty estimates in some sense to guide in, the, in terms of how to improve the model. Um, and finally, uh, they can, uh, the data scientists can hand over the model or uh, have a way of communicating the uncertainty to the house seller, right? So let's look at these steps quickly. Um, so, so this is a uh, sort of uh, thinking that a data scientists can have, right? So they're starting to build a new model. They have a choice of using intrinsic algorithms. Um, the, uh, the data set is relatively small. 
uh, so they can uh, they have freedom to choose uh, a, approach. Um, so in this case, the data scientists choose, let's say, Gaussian processes, which can capture both data and model uncertainty, right? So, um, and so the day, the house seller uh, sets a desired uh, PICP score, the coverage probability of 95. What that means is they want a model which will uh, emit prediction intervals, which will contain the ground truth 95% of the time. That's the desired uh, requirement, right? So, uh, so once the model is built, then you can uh, compute the PICP score and to get more insight into the uh, model's performance, they can also uh, look at how the PICP score looks across different features, right? So we assume that this model, simple model has just two features, uh, number of rooms and crime rate, and we are trying to predict the house price. And you can see that um, uh, in most cases, the PICP score uh, is um, below the desired level of 95%, right? And it's especially bad when the number of rooms are large. So uh, then the data scientists can use a recalibration technique. So in this case, we use the uncertainty characteristic curve, which Jerry will go into much more detail. And by using this recalibration procedure, the data scientists can improve the coverage probability, the PICP score um, above the desired level of 95%, right? And the price that we had to pay here is that the average uncertainty has gone up. Uh, the, the average bandwidth has gone up a little bit. So um, let's go back. Uh, let me skip the improvement of the model part for the uh, sake of time and just look at the final step, right? So assuming the data scientist is happy with the model and now let's uh, look at how the uncertainty is communicated, right? So um, there are different choices here. I mean, the first choice, um, is uh, just uh, give it verbally, right? So you have the best guess from the model and then you can communicate its uh, prediction interval using this, uh, uh, these plus or minus uh, quantile ranges, right? Uh, it's also possible to give the whole distribution. Um, this might be uh, useful to get much more detailed insights into the uncertainty for this particular instance, uh, but uh, it might also be much more desirable to show something called as quantile dot plot, which shows the relative um, uh, likelihood values for different uh, possible house prices, right? And this much this could be much more digestible. So um, yeah, uh, let me just show a few other things on this website, and then I can take a pause and uh, answer some questions. Um, so, so this website has some other uh, useful things that you might uh, uh, care to look at. Um, as I mentioned, you can click on this link and join the uh, Slack community um, for um, if you're interested. This was the web demo link and we have an overview here which um, sort of describe the same thing that I mentioned, the different capabilities and how to use uncertainty quantification and so on. And we sort of have a some bit, uh, little bit detailed guidance on when to use which algorithm and the metrics as well. Uh, we also have a detailed guide on uncertainty communication. So do check this out. Um, uh, the glossary describes the terms that I've been using uh, more formally and uh, in some of our recent papers and links to the tutorials, which will be covered in a bit. And the homepage also has links to the tutorials, the different algorithms and, and uh, the uh, different metrics as well, right? And uh, the links in the top here will take you to the, uh, the API docs and you can get more uh, details about each algorithm and metric. Um, and finally, this will take you to the GitHub page, right? So, um, yeah, so let me take a pause here. And if you want to start setting up the node, uh, the package, you can follow the instructions here. Uh, it might be desirable to be the local installation so that you can get access to this examples that Jerry and Somya will cover. Uh, all right, so Leah, let me take a pause here for five minutes and see if there are questions. Um, uh, Prasanna, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you? 
Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question. This is the moderator. Um, yeah. This is related to the output of a binary logistic regression model. Let's say, for example, it outputs 0.55 as you indicated, and uh, one and um, the, I mean the probability from zero to one is 55 percent. When do you say I can trust? Oh, I can cut off maybe at 0.6 and say, oh, that's enough. It's uncertain. It's not. It's. We, we, I'm asking basically. Can you just use the output of the model score instead of using a quantification of uncertainty? When do you choose to use an PICP, for example, instead of just using the output of the model score? Right. So the PICP score is more applicable for the uh, the regression case, right? So if I go back to the slides for a brief bit, but if you look at the classification case, right, and I mean, the desirable property is if the model has a confidence of 0.55, like for a particular instance, then uh, if you want to measure how good or how trustworthy that prediction is, you will have to look at all the instances uh, where the model gave a score of 0.55. And you need to check what is the accuracy of the model, right? If the accuracy is 55% on all those instances, then it is well calibrated. So it's at least the uncertainty is trustworthy. But then the I think the other question that you alluded to is like when you accept this, uh, when we use this prediction or not, because it's uncertain and that's where the decision maker will come into the picture, right? So they have to decide what is the cutoff for them and uh, like how much uncertainty is uh, sort of um, uh, acceptable to them. So that's, I think that's like an application dependent question. Yes, and then um, do you have any one specific um, UQ uh, per, um, metric that you say, oh, I recommend this for this particular situation all the time, instead of having several metrics? Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. I think for classification, like uh, expected calibration error, which sort of is like a summary of this reliability plot, that's like the most common um, metric to use. Um, so that's that's a good um, and definitely a good metric to always see for classification cases. Uh, there is also something called as risk versus rejection plot. So you're trying to see like if I reject certain fraction of samples where there is high uncertainty, do I reduce the model error, right? So the, the expectation is as you reject uh, instances which have high uncertainty, the remaining instances where the uncertainty was low, we expect that the error will go down compared to all the instances, right? So that's also a good um, uh, metric to see for classifications. And for regression, I think these two are typically uh, used quite a lot to see how, uh, so first, I mean, this is basically telling you how trustworthy the uncertainties are, right? Do they cover the ground truth or not? And this tells you like how uncertain the model is. So we want both of these to be small, right? Because if there is too much uncertainty, then again, it's not really useful. And then Jiri will pro go into much more detail into uh, something new that we have, which is called uncertainty characteristic curve, which is uh, trying to be uh, agnostic to these sort of uh, different operating points, right? Which, which will give you a much more uh, concise and uh, deeper sort of uh, look into the scores. And maybe that, that might be something that you could use. Um, Prasanna, just a comment. I see in the chat that somebody is trying to clone our repo and they are using github.ibm.com. I'm not sure. Uh, I might have missed it, but uh, if you check on the link that you posted, just for the record that we have it correct. Oh, this should be the link. Um, yeah, that's the link. Uh, so it's the public GitHub, github.com, not github.ibm.com. Oh, apologies if I have posted that somewhere. Uh, this should be the public link. Yeah. Is there a question? Oh yeah, sorry. I just asked about um, the whole recalibration thing where I like the idea uh, where your objective there was to maximize PICP, um, where you mentioned that uh, the trade-off was the increase of the other acronym that starts with M. But my main um, concern is that um, by doing so, the analyst is ignoring possible bias of the model. I believe that um, Jiri 
uh, is addressing that, but I just think um, that it's better practice to try to resolve bias issues than just uh, conflating uncertainty. So what's your opinion about, about that? Yeah, that's, that's a, I think that's a good point. Um, um, so when you say uh, bias, do you mean like the, the fairness issues or you, you mean in general? Um, the model imagine, your data, imagine your data is a quadratic and you're using a linear model. Okay, that's obvious bias, and you're just going to conflate your uncertainties where you're totally off because um, because you're not using the right uh, model. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, uh, but uh, sometimes we don't have liberty to change the model. Right. I skipped a step where we have to improve the model. Uh, so that's so that's definitely wherever it's possible, we should improve the model. Right. But when it's not, I think uh, at least we can make sure that whatever uncertainties we provide, those at least have good coverage guarantees, right? And um, I think at least that's something that is desirable when you can't have the right model. And that, that's what I would say, but you're right. I think uh, if we have the freedom to improve the model, we should definitely do that. Okay, great, thanks. I have another, can I ask another question? Sure, yeah. Uh, so something that I felt was missing for me in terms of the, um, the uh, probability uncertainty. It's just something I dabbled with a while ago. So let's say you have a neural network and it tells you uh, a probability. And, but then if you use a dropout layer or something like that and you ask it again, it might give you a totally different uh, 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 probability. And so I find myself using something called mutual information. Is that something uh, um, that, what I mean by that is the reliability that if you change um, your model just a bit, you, you'll get similar uh, probabilities. Because, uh, uh, for example, um, if on average you'll get a, 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 a 0 0.5 probability, you don't know if that is because it's consistently around the neighborhood of 0 0.5, or perhaps it's around half of the time uh, 0 and half uh, around you know 0 or 0 0.1 and half the time around 0 0.9 to 1. So that's where mutual information I found is useful and, and maybe you can point out if that's used in, in your mechanism. Yeah, I haven't seen that method, but that, that sounds quite interesting. But I just want to point out, like we have a lot of different um, algorithms and that's besides the reason, right? Some algorithms are deficient in some and some algorithms are better in some cases, but th there's no universally good algorithm, right? So we do have like ensembles, the, the dropout, MC dropout one do fall in this. We have fully Bayesian ones. So I think what you're mentioning could be something interesting to look at and try to include, but I haven't seen that before, yeah. Uh, maybe you can share Cheers, that paper. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on Slack. Sure. All right. So maybe um, let me hand it over to Soumya and we can do a deep dive into the infinitesimal jackknife and how to use that for uncertainty quantification. And yeah, feel free to uh, message and I can respond to any installation issues. Okay. Thanks, Rathana. Let me Let me start sharing. Okay, uh, so thanks everyone uh, for, uh, as Prasanna said, for joining us at this lunch hour. Uh, and thanks Prasanna for the overview. Uh, so I will talk about a specific method that's implemented in our toolbox. Uh, it's called the infinitesimal jackknife. Uh, it's a particular way to get the parametric uncertainties out uh, through a cheap but fairly accurate approximation to the classical statistical procedure of jackknife. Uh, so let's assume that we are in the supervised learning setting. So we are given some data set D uh, and we have N data points. Uh, the covariates of the features are denoted by X here and the responses of the labels are denoted by Y. Uh, and as a standard in a supervised learning problem, we're interested in learning the functional mapping from X to Y. We're going to assume that this functional mapping is parameterized by some set of parameters theta. So if you have a logistic regression model, these are the sets of uh, weights of a logistic regression model, for example. Okay, so we know how to learn these models. It's fairly well understood. So we'll simply do some form of empirical or if you have a regularizer, a regularized risk minimization. Uh, that is, we'll minimize this particular equation uh, where the first term uh, is basically just a summation over losses at every, at every data point. So where I'm using the L sub N theta as a shorthand notation for the loss evaluated at, a data, at the nth data point in this case. And R theta is just some regularizer, which is a, a function of the, uh, uh, of the parameter theta. Uh, 
So given some data set, we can solve this minimization problem and we end up with a optimal uh, parameter theta hat. The one thing I do want to emphasize here is that this theta hat is a function of your model, obviously, but it's also a function of the data set, right? Like if I had given you a slightly different data set, we, had solved the, we would have solved the same minimization problem, but would have arrived at a slightly different theta hat. So fairly obvious stuff, but we'll make this uh, explicit in our notation and express theta hat as a function of D, and D being the data set. Okay, so now uh, we can ask about the uncertainty in, in the parameters stemming from having observed a data set D, a sample uh, uh, data set D from some population, but not having observed the entire population itself. In other words, if I, uh, I observed a particular data set D, but how would my parameters have changed if I had observed a slightly different version of that data set D? Uh, so statisticians have worked on these problems for the longest time. Uh, so, and the math here is very well understood. So the standard way of dealing with this is to take your data set D uh, and perturb this data set D many times uh, in, in some way. And for each of these perturbed data set D, you'd fit a, um, uh, you'd refit the model or you'd do, redo that minimization problem that I was talking about. So for instance, one way you could perturb these data sets would be uh, by creating variants of the data sets where we are dropping out one data point at a time. So here D superscript one indicates the same data set as D, except that the first data point has been dropped out. So we go from X2, Y2 to Xn, Yn. I could repeat this and drop out the second data point and so on and so forth until uh, I drop out the last data point. So this is a particular type of resampling scheme that is extremely, uh, that is widely used. So procedures like the jackknife and even something like the leave one out cross validation, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, uh, basically employ this, uh, this sort of resampling scheme. Now, once we have these S or N different resampled variants of the data set, for each of them, we are going to fit, uh, fit, uh, fit our model. So do the minimization problem again. And then we'll get slightly different values of theta for each of these data sets. And these slightly different values of theta give us a sense of the spread of thetas or uh, a sense of uncertainty in the theta that arise from having only observed a sample rather than the entire population. So by looking at the spread, it gives you a notion of uncertainty. Okay, so this perturb and refit approach is widely used in practice, right? Like the jackknife, bootstrap, Variants of cross-validation can all be thought of instances of this approach, where you're just re where you're just changing the way you resample uh, the data sets, the way you create the data sets D superscript one through D superscript S, and then as long as we know how to fit our model to one data set, we basically doing this is procedurally trivial, right? Like I just have to fit this to my S different data sets. So this thing is procedurally trivial, but turns out that it is. Since it requires S different fits, it can be computationally quite expensive, especially for large modern data sets where you have a lot of data points, this can be prohibitively expensive. So the infinitesimal jackknife, which I'll talk about right now, uh, provides a fast approximation uh, to the scheme. So instead of refitting, uh, so you'll still, create, you'll still create a bunch of resampled data sets, D1, 2, through DS. But instead of refitting for each of these data sets, you'd refit the model exactly once on the original data set. So you'd, you'd uh, refit the model to this guy, D. And then we can approximate, uh, which involves the approximation involves just a single matrix multiplication, uh, what the parameter values would be at all of the other data sets, D1 through DS. Uh, However, before I can actually introduce what the uh, IJ mechanism is, we need a little more machinery. Uh, so first we'll consider a weighted version of our original learning problem. Uh, so uh, notice that in the second equation right here, the only thing I've changed is now I have a weight W sub n. Think of this as just a real scalar, uh, a scalar, uh, a real number, which weights every data point specific loss function. And then we are going to solve this weighted optimization problem. And one thing to note now is that theta hat is a function of both the data set D, uh, which I have not chosen to highlight here, but is also a function of W. 
Uh, so now uh, it's fairly obvious if I set all my W sub n's equal to one, or in other words, like if I use a vector, let's call uh, uh, n dimensional vector W sub one of all ones uh, and solve the weighted or, uh, optimization problem, I recover my original optimization problem, right? Because you know we're just multiplying all my loss functions with one, so nothing has really changed. Okay. Uh, but more interestingly, if I set a particular coordinate of my uh, weight vector, say the nth coordinate of my weight vector of all ones to zero, and solve the weighted optimization problem, that, is, uh, that solution corresponds to solving the unweighted optimization problem where the nth data point has been dropped out. Again, this is fairly easy to see because if I set one of these W sub n's to zero, I'm just taking out the contribution that the nth data point made uh, to my original optimization problem. So that's like fitting my original optimization problem uh, with dropping that particular data point out. We can extend this reasoning. Uh, so instead of dropping out a single data point, we can imagine dropping out k data points. So that uh, amounts to setting a bunch of zeros in this n-dimensional weight vector that I have. Where n, uh, in case I didn't mention, uh, capital N is the number of training points that you have. Uh, so this allows us to emulate things like uh, uh, k-fold cross-validation. And we can also think of about making the weight vector itself random. And then if we draw this weight vector from a appropriate distribution, it allows us to emulate things like the bootstrap. So for the bootstrap, you have to draw it from a multinomial distribution, as it turns out. Okay, so, um, so we took our original, original learning problem, converted it into this weighted learning problem. Uh, the, the weighted learning problem allows us to express uh, uh, the parameters theta as a function of W. So now the key idea behind infinitesimal jackknife, which is going to allow us to move away from refitting the models, uh, is basically a Taylor series expansion. Uh, the idea is that we can approximate the parameters theta at some arbitrary weight vector, uh, which is close to the vector of all ones, by performing a Taylor series expansion around the vector of all ones. The first order Taylor series approximation uh, is uh, sometimes called the influence function or the infinitesimal jackknife. They, go, they have a couple of different names. And there are other higher order terms, obviously, in the Taylor series expansion. Uh, you can in include these higher order terms. Uh, they come at the expense of more computation, but uh, they give you increasingly more accurate uh, approximations. Uh, and it is uh, sometimes useful for certain kinds of perturbations like the bootstrap uh, to get anything out of these kinds of approximations, you would probably want the higher order terms. Uh, the toolbox currently only implements the first order Taylor expansion, which nonetheless is accurate and increasingly accurate with as n, where n is the number of training points uh, increases and the delta w, the perturbation uh, in the weight vector is small. Uh, and turns out that uh, uh, if you work out what this expression is, you end up with a term which looks like this, uh, where theta hat w1 is the original fit. So this is uh, having solved the original optimization problem on the entire training data set, you end up with the parameter, uh, and that parameter is theta hat w1. And then you have a term which involves the Hessian of the model, and you have a term which involves the various gradients of the model. So you typically have the gradients of the model because we're typically doing gradient-based fitting, but the additional requirement is that we have this Hessian available. So we do need our models to be twice differentiable for this sort of approximation to hold. Okay. Okay, so now with the Taylor series expansion at hand, we can finally specify an a algorithm which allows us to basically refit these models for free by approximating using the Taylor series approximation. So step one is fit your model once to the entire data set, right? Uh, so we had to do this anyway, but like we, we'll do it specifically for enabling this uh, approximation happening uh, to happen. Step two is to compute the Hessian of the model on the training set. This uh, and invert it. Uh, 
Uh, the inversion of the Hessian um, in general takes cubic time in, uh, in the number of parameters in the model, but if there's structure in your model, sometimes you can speed this up. But crucially, you have to do this only once. Now, uh, perturb your data set a little bit. For each perturb data set, figure out what the appropriate weighting is, and these are typically easy to figure out. So for example, if you're doing jackknife, your appropriate weighting is just setting one coordinate of your data point uh, to zero. Uh, and then use equation one, this guy right here, uh, to approximate what theta d sub s is. And finally, repeat steps three and four as, uh, as often as necessary for each of your perturbed data sets. So crucially, uh, the expensive bits, which is fitting the model uh, and computing the inverse of the Hessian need to be done only once. After that, you need to be able to uh, evaluate this equation and you can do this pretty easily and it involves really the bottleneck is one matrix multiplication. So this guy, which is a P by P vector, P being the number of parameters in your model uh, with uh, a P by N matrix where N is the number of data points. Uh, interestingly, if you structure your uh, weights in a way where only a little, only a few of the weight coordinates are changing from the vector of all ones, you don't even have to do this matrix multiplication. It turns out that you can just do a few matrix vector uh, multiplications and that's enough. Uh, all that to say that this can be done pretty efficiently. Uh, and that's the algorithm. So instead of doing S refits, which can be extremely expensive, we just do uh, one refit and then do S matrix vector multiplications uh, to approximate what the parameter values would be. Uh, there are also extensions to this work, which I won't have the time to get into, unfortunately, uh, in this tutorial, which allow you to extend this to structured data and structured models. So instead of dropping out data points, which are IID, which are independent of all other data points, you can actually drop out time, uh, time steps from within a time series, a spatial uh, uh, sites from within a spatial extent. Uh, okay, so without further ado, and in the interest of time, I'll just move on to the demo. Uh, but if you'd like to learn more about, um, uh, about all the stuff that I quickly uh, went over in this, uh, uh, in this brief presentation, uh, these are based on primarily on these two papers, one uh, 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 which came out in AI Stats a couple of years ago and our NeurIPS paper from last year. Uh, beyond, beyond the methods that I just uh, talked about, they provide theory which, bounds, which allows you to bound the error in the approximation so that these things It'll tell you when these things are, uh, are accurate and when they are not. Uh, and it also tells you that the error in the uh, approximation in the IJ approximation go, grows smoothly with the error in the initial model fit. Uh, this bit is kind of important because that allows you to use uh, these sorts of approximations with stochastic gradient methods. So basically all of modern machine learning does SGD style fitting of these models. Uh, uh, turns out that this theory which says that maybe if you don't fit the model initial model exactly, but use stochastic gradient methods, everything would roughly be fine. Okay, so next I'm gonna move on to this demo. Uh, uh, it's hosted uh, in the repository under the exams, uh, examples folder. So if you'd like to follow along, uh, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the part to the IPython notebook that I'll go over. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my, uh, see the IPython notebook. Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so again, the notebook is hosted in the examples folder under the infinitesimal jackknife uh, folder. And the one that I'm running here is demo infinitesimal jackknife.ipython uh, notebook. Okay, so for this uh, notebook, we are going to demo it on a simple logistic regression model. So in addition to importing various stuff uh, that is required by the, uh, uh, by the IJ or the infinitesimal jackknife approximation, we are going to go into utils and import a bunch of things which allow us the logistic, which provide us the logistic regression functionality. So let me run that. <clears throat> Okay, and we need some data. Uh, we could have used whatever data we wanted. For this particular demo, I'm just going to use simulated data. <clears throat> so here, uh, we are going to assume that the data has been generated uh, by the following generative procedure. 
Uh, so the covariates are going to be 10 dimensional Gaussian distributed random variables drawn from a zero mean Gaussian with uh, uh, isotropic covariance uh, matrix. A sigma square for this particular example has been set to four. I'm going to draw some weights at random, and then I'm going to draw the labels, so the responses from a Bernoulli distribution parameterized by the sigmoid transformed inner product between the weight and the data point X, right? Uh, this is all done in this uh, in this uh, helper function that we have, which is called synthetic LR data. It takes in two inputs, n, uh, n is the number of training points, and d, d is the dimensionality of the data that's being generated. It produces four things, the covariates, the training covariates, the training responses, the test covariates, and the test responses. Uh, the number of test covariates, so the test data points that it generates is 30% uh, of this number. So it'll be 300 in this particular case. Again, this is just for illustration. You can actually fit it to whatever model that you like, uh, whatever data that you like to do, like to work with. Okay, so now that we have some data, let's go ahead and fit our logistic regression model. Um, so uh, for this purpose, we have a utility function within the logistic regression class dot fit. And this function takes in four inputs. Uh, as you can imagine, the training data goes in, the training covariates and the training targets, along with a initial guess of what the parameters should be and a weight vector. So I'm passing in the weight vector because this would make our life easier when dealing with the infinitesimal jackknife uh, uh, sort of approximation. Uh, so this weight vector is a vector of shape one and n, where n is the number of training inputs. Uh, so here I'm generating that weight vector right here. So this is going to be a vector of all ones, uh, of shape one and uh, 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 one and n, where n is the number of training inputs again. Uh, so if, if, if this is a vector of all ones, then uh, as you recall from the slides, you end up with the original minimization problem. So doing this fit is basically doing maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, what this function fit returns are the estimated parameters after having done this minimization. Uh, for the minimization fit is internally just calling SciPy's minimize function. So that's either using BFGS or LBFGS depending on the, uh, uh, depending on wh whatever uh, SciPy decides is appropriate for the problem at hand. Uh, and then once we have the parameters, we can ask what the accuracy on the test data set is. Um, so for that, we have a get test accuracy function. So again, fairly standard stuff. So let's just run that. Uh, so it did something, the optimization terminated successfully, and we end up with a test accuracy of 81%, which is fine for a simple linear model. Again, the goal here is not to push um, uh, accuracy numbers, but just to illustrate uh, infinitesimal jackknife. Right, so, so with a reasonable model at hand, uh, we can go ahead and do all the computations that are necessary for the infinitesimal jackknife approximation. Uh, so again, recall from the slides, we need two things, right? Like we need the Hessian of the model. So for that, we uh, provide a utility function, compute Hessian. Uh, all of these, by the way, internally uh, use autodiff uh, tools, right? Like, so these are, if you wanted to do this for your own model and not our particular model, these are uh, these functions extend to your models as long as you can auto differentiate through the model. Uh, and we need it to compute the gradients. So these could have been stored while fitting the model, but I'm just going to assume that you did not store the gradients while fitting the model. So we are going to recompute them and package them into a Jacobian matrix uh, J. So for that, we have another function, uh, uh, compute Jacobian. These are just utility functions. Uh, and then finally, we can call, instantiate the infin, infinitesimal jackknife object. It takes in uh, the fit parameters. So parameters from the model having been fit to the entire training data set, uh, the Jacobian matrix, the Hessian matrix, and a, a couple of configuration uh, parameters, which are not particularly important. Um, uh, so I'm just gonna skip over what those are. Okay, so let's run that. Uh, since this was a fairly small, uh, problem, so n is 1,000 and our uh, uh, dimensionality is 10, computing the Hessian and inverting it um, does not take a lot of time. Okay, so now we have all the things that we needed to pre-compute uh, uh, available. So we had to do all this sort of heavy lifting of fitting the model and computing and inverting the Hessian ones. All of that is done now. Uh, 
So now we can start uh, messing around with our original data set and using the IJ approximation. Uh, we could do something arbitrary. Uh, so for illustration here, I've decided to drop out the 957th training data point. Uh, and our goal is to approximate the parameters uh, having dropped out the 957th training data point. So if you're going to do this, remember like all we have to do is take a weight vector of all ones and set the 957th coordinate to be zero. So that's basically what I'm doing here. And then we can call the IJ, there's a function, there's a method in the IJ uh, class, uh, unfortunately also named IJ. Um, in hindsight, we should have named it something more informative, uh, which takes uh, as its input, this weight vector that I've just provided, uh, that we have just created and outputs the IJ approximation to what the parameters would be. Uh, and these parameters behave exactly the same uh, as the parameters you'd uh, get out of, a, of running the FET model uh, using the FET uh, procedure. So we can set the logistic regressions parameters to the IJ approximation. Uh, and then we can ask for predictions from the logistic regression model on the held out data. So since we had held out the 957th data point, uh, it'll, it'll give you a prediction on the 957 data point using uh, logistic regression dot predict. So let's run this. And uh, it does something. So it gives us the probability of class one uh, as approximated by IJ is this value. So this value in itself does not mean anything. Hopefully this is accurate. So one thing that you might want to do next is to assess how accurate this approximation is. Uh, uh, so there's some theory which tells us that increasingly uh, increasing n, as in increasing the number of data points uh, and uh, making small perturbations to the weight vector guarantees, uh, provides certain bounds on the error in the IJ approximation. But we can also test it out empirically for a particular data set. So in particular, what you could imagine doing is leaving out a few data points uh, and uh, and exactly refitting your model and comparing the predictions made by the exact refitted models with the predictions made by the IG approximations. Uh, so that's basically what's happening in this cell. For uh, here, uh, for the sake of illustration, I've decided to pick the first 20 data points. We are going to leave each of these 20 data points one at a time uh, and do both the IG approximation and the exact refit. Again, since the, this is a very small uh, data set, both uh, the, the exact refit is also fairly fast. So we can actually run this in, uh, in real time uh, and look at what happens. So this is a scatter plot of predictions on each of those 20 data points that we had left out. Uh, the x-axis is the predicted value uh, under the exact approximation. And the y-axis for each of these red dots is the predicted value under the infinitesimal jackknife approximation. The closer uh, this red dot is to the diagonal line, the better the match between IJ, uh, the approximation, and the exact procedure. You can also quantitatively look at what the uh, differences are in, in the predictions. And uh, you know, there are some differences, but these are uh, fairly small. And again, like since things line up uh, on the diagonal, we can kind of uh, uh, we can see that these things are very accurate. Uh, and again, uh, uh, as the number of data points increases, it's only going to get more accurate. So which is nice in a couple of different ways. One reason for you wanting to use this kind of approximation is when you have a lot of data points. Otherwise, maybe you could have just refit um, exactly. Uh, and it turns out that in, in specifically in that regime where you have a lot of data points, these, uh, these approximations become increasingly accurate. All right, so now, uh, um, we run this approximation for a bunch of different uh, perturbed variants of the data set, and then we can uh, ask it to make predictions with each of those perturbed parameters that I got from having fed the perturbed data sets. And that's what this predict function would do. It will give you the mean prediction and a lower bound and an upper bound. Uh, the interquantile range of this lower bound and upper bound are specified um, uh, through the configuration parameters up here, which I'd skipped over a while back. So basically this alpha controls the, uh, tells you what lower bound and upper bound to expect. Uh, 
So again, so we can run this and it'll, it'll give you results as you'd expect. So this guy in the middle is the mean prediction and this is the lower bound and the upper bound from having done the infinitesimal jackknife approximation to the exact jackknife. So having left out one data point at a time for all the thousand training data points. And these are predictions on the test set, by the way. Uh, so I'm going to speed up a little bit in the interest of time. Um, so again, as I was suggesting in my slides, there's no reason to just delete one data point. We could do this with more data points. So here I've picked uh, 20 random indices to set to zero. So we could do that. And then we can approximate the parameters um, uh, having left out these 20 data points. Uh, one note of caution here is that although this would be accurate, the farther away you move in the weight vector space from the vector of all ones, since we are doing a Taylor series approximation about the vector of all ones, uh, you would expect our accuracy to go down. So if you make a lot of the coordinates zero, uh, maybe you wouldn't get uh, as accurate an approximation using IJS as, as you otherwise would have. Uh, and a quick note that uh, we don't have to have these weights be binary, not just zeros and ones. We could downweight, upweight these weights uh, arbitrarily, even have negative values. Uh, everything mechanistically will go through. You'd be able to run this code, it'll produce some set of parameters. It's less clear what, what your, uh, uh, how to interpret these parameters. Like having a negative weight, it's, it's, it's unclear what exactly you're approximating at that point. But you could do it if, if you have a good use case for it. Uh, and then finally, another plug, uh, we can do these kinds of things for structured models. I wouldn't have the time to go into it uh, in this tutorial, but if you're interested, check out this demo. Again, it's in the same folder as this particular notebook. Uh, it walks you through on how to do this for a hidden Markov model. Uh, so with that, I'll end. Uh, I'll provide a plug for my colleague, Jiri, who's going to present next. Uh, so these infinitesimal jackknife style methods are interesting and they're useful, but they do ask a lot of you as a user. You need to have access to the model. Uh, your model needs to be twice differentiable. You need access to the training data so that you can compute the Hessian. Uh, if you don't have access to any of those things, it becomes tricky uh, and it's uh, not, a, not always clear how you, you would use these approximations. So Jiri in his next bit of the talk, uh, next bit of this tutorial, will talk about black box methods, which are uh, very different from the stuff that we talked about, uh, which allow you to do that when, when all you have access to are the inputs and outputs of your model, but not the model itself. First Hello Jiri. everyone, um, I'm Jiri Navratil, and I'm happy to walk you through the third part let me just start uh, sharing. All right, so uh, we thought we will uh, uh, spend the uh, third third to highlight a couple more methods that are featured in the UQ360 toolkit that are somewhat novel and very interesting also from the practical perspective. And these two things are, um, uh, the first one is a method, which we refer to as meta modeling. And the uh, second one is a metric that uh, we believe is a very useful tool in the assessment of the quality of uh, uncertainty quantification in particular prediction intervals in regression. So I'm going to start with the first one, um, the meta-modeling method. Um, you may remember from uh, Prasanna's uh, uh, presentation that we, when designing this toolkit, we set out uh, with one major high-level categorization in mind, uh, categorization of approaches. Most uncertainty quantification approaches can be classed into two bins, intrinsic and extrinsic. So while you heard that the intrinsic approaches are those that uh, are based on models that actually have the capability of producing uncertainty quantification as a byproduct of their parametric structure and functions and whatnot, um, such as Bayesian models and Gaussian processes, ensembles, are in, um, there are many, many examples in this class. The extrinsic approaches that you see listed here um, as a repeat, 
are based on the idea that we have a pre-existing model that may or may not have the, the, the ability to produce uh, uncertainty. And we do something on top of it. That's why they are also called post hoc or they are actually referred to in the class structure in UQ360 as post hoc um, methods. I would like to pick uh, one specific approach here that we uh, again call meta modeling. The idea here is that you have a base model that is taking care of a task at hand, be it classification, regression, ranking, and whatnot, structural prediction. Um, and now we have a secondary model that acts as an observer. It gets to see the inputs and the outputs of the base model. And it's trained to predict the success rate or failure rate, if you will, of the base model, okay? Now, there are several variants. In one simpler variant, the meta model here, the observer gets to see, only gets to see the input and the output of the base model, in a, which we refer to as black box setting. And uh, in another variant, it actually gets access to the inner workings of the base, um, which might lead to an improved uncertainty prediction. And that is referred to as white box. Now, why do we feel strongly about, uh, and by the way, I will be showing um, a quick demo of a particular um, setting uh, of a black box meta model in, uh, on a regression task. Now, we, we do feel very strongly about this, and that has several reasons. Uh, first and foremost, this is a very practical solution to many, many issues that, um, you know, developers, researchers are faced with in practice when deploying AI models. There are many cases where you are given a model that has been trained by someone else. Let's say you have a client's model to which you don't really have any reasonable access. You cannot retrain it. Um, it may have been trained on large amounts of potentially uh, a proprietary data, um, but that model does not come with the ability to produce its own uncertainty. But we know that uncertainty quantification is, a, is basically a number one um, concern when we deploy AI models. And uh, meta modeling is really the solution that offers itself, in particular the, in the black box setting here, where you can equip that model without needing any access to it. Um, besides that, there are also uh, sort of related advantages that are, there are many, so I just wanted to pick, pick here one, that are based on the fact that you can learn, you can teach the meta model to predict uncertainty or issues of the base model when you expose the base model to completely new conditions, for example, out of domain data. Um, uh, which is actually not necessarily possible at training time of the original base model. Um, another advantage we might actually mention is that uh, meta modeling can capture both uh, data and model uncertainty or aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. And, and finally, it, this method has been demonstrated to be effective. It is uh, competitive to state of the art in, in was shown actually that in many settings, it outperformed a series of competitive baselines. And I um, put some references here for you to follow if you're interested in further details. Now in the toolkit per se, we uh, have all of these meta modeling versions deriving from one abstraction that is the post hoc UQ, which you will see if you have downloaded the toolkit so you can either derive from there to implement your own meta modeling approach, but we also provide two main uh, flexible classes, uh, one for classification, one for regression, and that I will demonstrate now. So let me see. Let me see. Before maybe going into the notebook, I just wanted to mention briefly what is the sort of high level interface. So at instantiation time, the user uh, provides some kind of a specification of the base model 
and the meta model in terms of structure? What would you like to have there um, uh, as, a, as a meta model primarily, but uh, you can bring your own base model. And there are three possible ways of specifying this for each of these, for base and meta. Um, one way is naming it. Um, and I will show you an example of that. Another way is providing a class specification or a class declaration rather. And the third way is to provide an actual pointer to an instance, to an existing instance. Once one of these classes is instantiated, there are two main public methods, fit and predict with the obvious meanings. And this is by the way, consistent with other modules in UQ360. This example notebook um, exercises the regression, um, a regression task. There is another notebook for a classification task and is stored in the folder black box meta model in, in UQ360 examples, <clears throat> black box meta model. Okay, so feel free to follow through with the steps that I will be doing. We are using a small regression task based on house price prediction um, or involving house price prediction. And I'm going to show how easy it is to create a meta model um, given a base model, okay? So these steps are all obvious. The main line here is that we are um, including, importing the meta model regression class from UQ360, the rest is just collaterals. I'm then loading the Boston housing prices data set, which is a relatively small data set to play with. This is really just to show the process of creating such a model rather than focusing on performance. So the size of the data, data set is really not uh, worrisome here. Now I'm doing the classic um, data science steps and splitting the data set into training and test. Here, just a quick scatter plot of how the problem looks like. Mm, there are multiple features in this data set and the task is to, it's a regression task to predict a house price. We are now choosing only a single feature as a predictor, as a covariate, and that is the number of rooms um, in a house, you can see that there is a relatively good amount of cor um, correlation. So we are good to go. A small routine to display some results. Now this notebook per se um, exercises all three instantiation methods that I meant, named by declaration or by instance. I'm gonna just show quickly the first one by name. This is essentially a, a simple case, like uh, you come and you say, hey, I don't even have a base model. Um, um, I would like to create, I, I would like this class to actually create a base model for me to do the regression as well as a meta model for me. Now I can do that by simply uh, relying on predefined names, um, which we have several of them in this class. GBR stands for gradient boosting regress regressor that I now choose for the base model as well as the meta model. And as a user, I can also specify um, certain parameters that I feel strongly about. I do not have to do it. There will be some defaults there. Um, that's the, the really the simplest way of instantiating uh, a meta model class. So now it's a named UQ model, that is the instance. Now I'm uh, invoking the main public method, the first main public method fit, during which uh, all the uh, parameter fitting is done. So that is done now. And the second key method is predict. So now I'm providing to the, as you could see that during the fitting stage, I have both training and observations or the actual ground truth here. I'm invoking the predict method with a batch of only the features. So that would be the number of rooms for samples. This method returns just like other um, regress regression related methods returns the regression, um, the regression prediction or the regressive prediction, the lower bound and the upper bound. And so I'm often referring to lower and upper bound as prediction interval. 
So that just happened. Let's take a look at the result. Uh, you see in this chart in solid orange, um, the regression prediction points obviously are the test points and upper and lower bound. Okay. Now I'm going to skip the method of uh, in, uh, instantiating by declaration and go to the more, really the most interesting practical scenario where, like I said before, you have a model as an instance. That model might be of any type. It doesn't have to be a scale learn model. It, it can be a, a client model. The only requirement that uh, we place on that instance is that it has to be able to, it has to provide fit and predict methods, okay? So now I'm simulating that by creating a, another gradient boosting regression he, regressor here and calling it base model. So this would be the, this is the simulation of the case where, okay, this model is trained on uh, hundreds, hundred thousands of hours of data or something like that. I'm also choosing to create an external instance of a meta model, which is in this case now a linear regression model, a linear regressor with some configuration. And now the key is that I as a user can pass pointers to these instances into the model meta model regression um, class, okay? And I got that instance called UQ model again. I, um, perform the fit and predict methods, okay, and can display the results here. So this is really a, a very simple walkthrough of the essential steps. That's really all there is to the very basic black box meta modeling. We have um, abstractions for white box meta modeling, and uh, you know that that give you. Uh, give you the base classes for multiple variants. We also have a recent a set of recent additions to, to the uh, UQ360 um, that implement uh, performance prediction and all kinds of interesting problems as instances of meta modeling. Now, at this point, um, maybe, I, maybe we can have a couple of minutes for questions before I move on to the second part. Uh, so for this uh, particular um, uh, model, you, do, you have to have the inputs and the model. But if you have just the model output, which is the model score, you cannot do anything with meta model. You still can, you still can. It is um, uh, you, the, the features into the meta model can be just the outputs of, um, of the uh, regressor. Ideally, you do want to have, let's say if you, if you take a look at the classification problem might be a better example. If you have a, a 10 class classifier uh, that uh, outputs, you know, and, and currently the base model just takes the maximum probability output as the class that it predicts you still can take the probabilities or the logits of the 10 classes as features and feed them as feature vectors into a meta model of your choosing, let's say a, a logistic regressor and potentially get an improvement over, or basically uh, it depends what you compare to, but you can get an improved quality of, of the uncertainty that comes out of the meta model if that makes sense. I see. Feeding it, feeding the features, the inputs, of course, gives the meta model more chances to perform well, but it is not required. Looks like Dan, Dan G has a question. You can mute, unmute yourself and ask it directly. Sure, thank you. Yeah, um, I, it looks like the red upper bound, lower bound is the same. Uh, distance from the predicted in terms of the y-axis at sort of every value of number of rooms. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason why around six where there are more data points, uh, the bands aren't narrower? Well, in this case, I would not even want to go into interpreting these results on this very, very small data set. 
And you are right that uh, in this implementation, the bounds are symmetric. That doesn't mean that uh, the concept is limited to it. In fact, you can have um, separate meta model or separate components within the meta model to predict lower and upper bound, just like you can have similar, you know, set up with quanta regression. So this class, you are right, has um, predicts or generates symmetric uncertainty predictions, prediction intervals. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this is a very simple example. I mean, I think going into the detail here into interpreting, like it does happen with the gradient boosting regressor that it does widen, but uh, it's tricky. It's very small. So at this point, I think it might make sense if I um, go to the second part. I would like to, and I'm not sure how much time I will have, so I would like to just uh, bring this to your attention as an interesting um, addition to the sort of toolbox, researcher's toolbox, something we call um, uncertainty characteristics curve. We believe that it's a very useful tool, but uh, we leave it up to you to decide. There is, um, uh, it has an implementation in UQ360 accompanied by um, a notebook that goes actually into detail and walks you through all the functionality. I will just give you a gist of what this is about. So often, um, and I think Prasanna touched on it, um, often we are dealing with the question, how do we uh, assess the quality of uncertainty? And in regression tasks, again, we are talking about prediction intervals, lower and upper bound. Uh, what you typically see is some kind of a notion of how, how well calibrated these um, prediction intervals are. Um, many papers, in fact, will give you the notion of calibration in terms of, okay, we trained it to be 95% uh, sort of uh, coverage, and that's what happened on our held out test set. But not much further information will be given, for example, where these uh, intervals um, wide or narrow or you know, what was the mean bandwidth, the other met metric. That is one type of problem that I see. The other type of problem is that uh, people, um, when, they, when they do um, um, coverage, um, coverage probability, uh, they decide on a certain level of confidence, for example, um, 0.95. Another work might actually decide on 0.9 or 0.99, and um, that makes uh, the work kind of not necessarily not comparable, but hard to compare. So we now s refer to this type of settings, like 0.95, as an operating point. And we attempted to uh, create a tool that uh, is agnostic with respect to this operating point. That is what uncertainty characteristics curve is about. Um, I have this very brief motivating example. Imagine you have um, model A and model B both uh, generating prediction intervals around some regression, okay? So you have the same case, blue is regression prediction, orange is observation and the um, gray or bluish uh, area is prediction intervals around it. Now I might be tempted to say, well, I do want, I really prefer B because of the coverage probability. Uh, I miss only maybe 5% of points of my observations. This is, this is the way to go. Now, of course, I, this is an artificial example. If you now rescale the scenario and scale up the output of algorithm A, uh, you get a scenario where or you get an outcome where you capture the, the observation uh, really nicely. Again, this is an artificially nice example where you envelope the, all of the observations with minimal excess in bandwidth, okay? While if you scale down um, B's output that looked so good, you can see that um, 
there is really no signal in the shape of the prediction interval. It has nothing to do with the uh, observation shape. So, uh, and in fact, it has been, it was generated randomly. Um, so it's, it's really, if you think about it from this perspective, this would not be a good prediction interval. Now, I know this slide is busy, uh, so I would like you to just concentrate on this bi-dimensional graph. Now we have, uh, we already uh, had actually in, uh, somebody touched on it in the chat um, that at any point uh, you, mm, with, with, uh, with regression and prediction intervals, uh, you will encounter two types of um, costs or incur two types of costs. The first one is uh, loosely speaking by overshooting the observation. That is what we refer to as band excess, but it can be also measured by absolute bandwidth of your prediction intervals. And then at another point, we might undershoot and miss. So that is usually measured as the average miss rate, which is one minus um, coverage probability, or we have a metric that uh, is more of a soft measure of that, which is a deficit in bandwidth. Okay. So now we have a bi-dimensional graph with two axes. On one axis is the type one cost, on the other axis type two cost. The UQ360 UCC implementation lets you as a user actually choose among multiple variants. You can choose um, what I called excess, or you can choose absolute bandwidth. Uh, you can choose miss rate and this uh, band deficit. But overall, the idea is that we now have an axis system where we can see a trade-off. Now, how do we get that trade-off? We find a way to scale or yeah, scale down or scale up, inflate or deflate on the other way around um, the bands of the prediction interval so that we can actually start with a very thin sliver of a prediction interval around the a regression prediction and inflate it all the way up so that it envelopes all of our observations within a certain batch of data. This is all based on a, a sample of data such that our miss rate starts ranging from almost 100% with that uh, tiny sliver, we will be missing almost 100% of our observations and end up with a miss rate of zero as we envelope all of the observations. So that gives rise to a set of operating points or a uh, basically uh, a curve, it's not this similar to um, the receiver operating characteristics curves. This curve gives us now um, deeper insight into the behavior of each model that generates prediction intervals. There are often seen in practice cases of crossovers of different models, meaning model A might actually perform better in a low miss rate uh, operating region, but model B might be the better one in a higher miss rate uh, region. So this tool gives you that insight, that's one outcome. The other one is um, we calculate the area under such a curve uh, that gives us a scalar summary metric of the performance of a um, predict, prediction interval model um, that is what we say operate, operating point agnostic. Uh, imagine you do not necessarily know that uh, you, you don't have an application in mind when you develop the algorithm, or you might have an uh, application in mind, but you don't know what is the exact operating region. Are we focusing on 0.99 uh, coverage probability, or is it more 0.8? So such a metric can give you um, an agnostic view um, and might serve a more general uh, comparison. In UQ360, um, all the implementation is, is uh, hides in this class, uncertainty characteristics curve. There are many uh, features, methods that uh, are actually interesting, but there's no time to cover them. Um, the, um, the area under the curve, we call it AUUCC, is also 
produced by a regression matrix, which is a class that will give you many, many uh, uh, UQ metrics uh, in uh, basically covering some of the metrics that uh, Prasanna mentioned. So there you will see it as, uh, as the area under the UCC. And finally, I would like to point you to the demo notebook, which really walks you through pretty much all of the functionality of UCC. Okay, so um, I think at this point, we only have a couple of minutes of Prasanna and control to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, our presenters today for joining uh, Pi Data. Thank you, G uh, Chiri, Prasanna, Somia. Definitely, I learned a lot today about uh, UQ 360. <laughs> um, I think it's a good addition to AIF 360 and the other set of tools from IBM. <laughs>